You're listening to another podcast. A podcast not only of reviewing and discussing, but of discovery. A deep dive into a classic show whose influence is immeasurable. Your next stop, Anthology. Hello and welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and if this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast where I review The Twilight Zone as a first-time viewer and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology series. For archives of all of my episodes, visit AnthologyPod.com. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod, and follow me on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. And if you'd like to... to so, wow. <laughs> and if you'd like to support what I do here... You can become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer where you get access to tons of um, exclusive content across four different um, reward tiers. So if you pledge $1 per month, you get exclusive B-roll episodes. As of this recording, there are over 120 uh, full-length B-roll episodes. I say full-length, it's like 20 to 30 minutes. Um, B-roll episodes of just kind of talking about nonsensical topics. Um, at $2 per month, you get that, plus TV review and reaction episodes, where I record recaps and reviews of each episode of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and I have a, rev- a full series review of Superstore up there, um, and a lot of just TV-centric stuff. And then if you pledge $5 per month, you get all of that, plus movie commentary tracks and re- immediate reviews. Um, some recent commentary tracks I did was for, uh, Ex Machina, Superbad, Sunshine, the original 1954 Godzilla, and, um, also at that level, since, um, I'm, I'm super excited about this, since as of this recording, I'm 48 hours away from, uh, being, I guess, considered fully vaccinated from coronavirus, and I am finally getting back to going to the movie theater, and, Man, I'm so excited about that. I've not been to, I'm recording this April 17th. I have not been to a movie theater since March 11th, 2020. And I'm super excited about that. And since I'm going to be making my way back to the movie theater, I'm going to be doing more uh, video immediate reaction reviews of movies I see in theaters. So that'll be on the $5 per month uh, Patreon tier on Patreon. So you get all of that for $5. And then finally, at the $10 a month uh, level, you get everything that I've said before uh, before this, everything I've said, plus early access to podcast episodes and previously unreleased content. So just for, uh, just for reference, uh, like I said, I'm recording this April 17th, but um, this episode isn't going to be posted on the main feed until oh, May 5th, I think. And, the, but the patrons at the $10 per month level have actually had access to this episode since April 22nd. So a full two weeks before, um, before the episode dropped on the main feed. So, um, yeah, so that's a breakdown of our Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Um, everything that I make off of Patreon goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and everything. I have three podcasts and a website to run. So, and I do all of this in my free time. So, if you're in a giving mood, check out patreon.com slash obsessive viewer because there's a ton a ton of new content there. Um, so uh, having gotten that out of the way, today on the show, I'll be discussing The Grave. It's the seventh episode of The Twilight Zone's third season, and it originally aired on October 27th, 1961. And I will be rounding out the episode with a brief review of science fiction theater season one, episode 16, The Stones Began to Move. And before I get into the actual episode, I do want to give a shout out to a new listener, uh, Matt. He, uh, and I swear it's not me under, <laughs> under a, a different, uh, Twitter. Um, although he is in Indiana also, so that's kind of funny. But anyway, uh, shout out to Matt. Thank you for reaching out. Uh, Matt sent me a very nice tweet saying, uh, new listener here, great stuff. And in reference to my episode covering the shelter, he said, I loved your political commentary on the January 7th, uh, January 6th insurrection. Uh, just imagine if Rod was here today to see all of this idiocy. Keep it up. And uh, (laughs) reading that out loud, I'm really hoping that he meant the idiocy of the um, (laughs) January 6th insurrection and not the idiocy of my podcast. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, I know that's not the case. But anyway, shout out to Matt. Thank you so much for reaching out and for listening to the podcast. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the podcast because um, I really enjoy doing it. And I really like that I'm actually reaching people with this. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, all of the housekeeping is out of the way and everything. So... I'm going to go ahead and go into my review of The Grave. Now, as I am usually, as is usually the case, I'm going to be spoiling the entirety of the episode from the jump. So I'm going to be reading a plot summary courtesy of The Twilight Zone, Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic by Martin Grahams Jr. So here's your spoiler warning. If you don't want to be spoiled on The Grave, don't know why you're listening to this, but <laughs> uh, go watch it, come back, and resume the episode. So spoilers on. Here's the plot summary for The Grave. Pinto Sykes, wanted by the law in three states, is shot dead in the streets by a law-abiding committee of eight. Two evenings later, a hired gun named Connie Miller arrives in town, having spent the past few months seeking out Sykes. His friends explain to Miller that on his deathbed, Sykes claimed Miller was a coward, having given him the opportunity to face off and Miller was a no-show. In his last dying breath, Sykes swore that if Miller comes near his grave, he'll reach out and grab him. The men in the bar, afraid to visit the grave themselves, bet money against the hired gun that he is afraid of Sykes, dead or alive. To prove his worth, Miller accepts the wager, t taking a bowie knife with him to plant in the fresh earth. Alone at midnight, he walks up to the, to the cemetery, finds the grave, removes the knife from his coat, and plants the blade firmly into the soil. In the morning, his friends arrive to find Miller dead, lying by the grave. Apparently, he had stabbed his coat onto the grave by accident, and when he felt the sudden tug on the coat, his heart gave out, dying of fright. But the wind was blowing the other way. So how or who grabbed the coat? The Grave stars Lee Marvin as Connie Miller, making his first of two Twilight Zone appearances. Next we'll see from him is in Season 5's Steel, and he also appeared in The Rack in 1956, which was a movie that adapted a teleplay by Serling that was originally um, performed uh, on the United States Steel Hour the year before. And uh, Lee Marvin is pretty famous. He kind of has had this reputation, I believe, of being kind of a kind of big tough guy actor he some of his notable roles were in the dirty dozen paint your wagon and the cane mutiny um and i didn't know that he was in any episodes of the twilight zone so that's pretty interesting i don't really know his uh acting that well or anything but um i'll get into his performance in this episode of course uh i do want to mention just <laughs> kind of in passing uh paint your wagon anytime i i haven't seen that movie but anytime i hear the um title i think of the bit on the simpsons where uh homer rents some videos and one of them is paint your wagon and bart is really excited and and like they're excited because it's like oh it's going to be this western and it's going to be super violent and everything and i think one of the lines is um <laughs> is paint your wagon with blood i bet and uh then they play it and it's a musical um I don't know. So anyway, I hear that. I just anytime I hear the title "Paint Your Wagon," I think "Gonna Paint Your Wagon," "Gonna Paint It Good." Um, we ain't lying. Uh, I can't remember the rest. Anyway, uh, James Best co-stars in this episode as Johnny Robb. This is his first of three Twilight Zone appearances. He'll appear later this season in The Last Rites of Jeff Myrtlebank, uh, which was also directed by the director of this episode, and he was also in 1956's The Rack. And he uh, also had an uncredited role in the movie Forbidden Planet, and he was in one episode of the short-lived 1977 series Tales of the Unexpected, which is not to be confused with Roald Dahl's show of the same name. This is a different show that lasted, I think, like six episodes or something. Um, one of his most notable roles was in the Dukes of Hazard as Roscoe P. Coltrane. I think like the sheriff's deputy or something. And uh, kind of an interesting to me at least, a um, bit of trivia is that he was actually raised in Corridon, Indiana, which is where my friend Mike, who is a recurring co-host on The Obsessive Viewer, where he's from. Um, Mike is the voice that you hear in the pre-recorded outros for all of the podcasts, kind of telling you where to find all of our all of our stuff. So uh, that's an interesting kind of um, surprising connection, because I don't really hear about people being from Corridon that often. <laughs> um, and Corridon is like... is like way down, like by Louisville on, on the south of the state. So 
Anyway, uh, as Steinhardt in this episode is Levon Cleef, and this was his only episode of The Twilight Zone. Notable credits include a plethora of westerns. Uh, he was in High Noon, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, uh, For a Few Dollars More, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and he was also in uh, John Carpenter's Escape from New York. And rounding out the cast, no, not rounding out the cast, because I have one other. <laughs> so we have Struther Martin as Mother's, uh, Mothershed. Uh, this was his only episode of The Twilight Zone. Uh, for the kind of um, sci-fi angle, he was in one episode of Lost in Space. And notable credits include a bunch of westerns as well. So he was in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance as well. Uh, cool Hand Luke, uh, which isn't a western, but um, <laughs> The Wild Bunch, True Grit, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And kind of interesting, this episode this episode of Anthology is like the Hoosier episode, because I referenced new listener Matt, and in, in, he lives in Indiana, and uh, now the guy who played uh, uh, James Best it was, in, was from Corden, and now we have uh, uh, Struther Martin, who grew up in... Uh, he was born in Kokomo, Indiana, and he grew up in Indianapolis and in Cloverdale, which Cloverdale, in relation to where I am, I don't know. It's it's, it's pretty pretty close. We played uh, Cloverdale teams in uh, Pee Wee uh, Pop Warner Football League um, when I was in like fourth grade. So anyway, that's irrelevant. So um, rounding out the cast for this episode is Ellen Willard as Ione Sykes. Uh, this was her only episode of The Twilight Zone. However, she did appear in one episode of One Step Beyond in 1960 called To Know the End. And her final role was in 1966 in an episode of The Man from U.N.C.L.E. before she apparently quit acting. And this was an interesting piece of trivia that I found, that in the book, uh, The 12 O'Clock High Logbook, which is a book about the show 12 O'Clock High, um, there was a quote saying that, uh, that one of her co-stars heard years later that she left acting because she found it too emotionally taxing. And what's interesting is that co-star was actually Earl Holloman, who was in Where Is Everybody? So, um, kind of an interesting Twilight Zone connection in connection with Ellen Willard's, uh, career and the end of her career. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So, um, this episode was both written and directed by Montgomery Pittman. This is his third of five Twilight Zones, and we previously saw his work in the season three premiere, uh, two, and next we'll see from him is in the episode, uh, Dead Man's Shoes, which is later this season. And, uh, I'm very curious about Dead Man's Shoes, because that is an episode that has a remake of Source, I believe, in the 80s series and in the 2000s. Uh, 2002 series so very curious to get to that episode um but yeah and a piece of trivia that i didn't i don't think i knew about him was that uh he actually died of cancer in june of 1962 which is uh pretty pretty surprising how recent in relation to his work on the twilight zone um was so some trivia about the writing of this episode there's there's kind of a lot about this episode that i'll get later after my review um in terms of how this episode came about, but from the Twilight Zone unlocking the door to a television classic, um, it says that uh, Montgomery Pittman got the inspiration for the story sitting on his father's knee. He's quoted as saying, I was just a lad growing up on my pappy's ranch in Oklahoma when I first heard the story of a, de uh, of a desperado who swore he would reach out from the grave and get the man who had been tracking him down. And... Uh, that I guess he that was quoted from a, pre, a CBS press release. Uh, press release, and he went on to say, "It seemed that whenever the wind began to howl, my pappy and his friends would sit around the pot-bellied stove, and he would tell the truth. This didn't this didn't happen just once, but about any time the wind was blowing up a storm." And uh, just from that quote, like I understand why so many of his, like he seems very, like this is a, like he seems like kind of a, I don't know the the kind of western persona is uh, personified in his quotes it's kind of interesting um and uh then to kind of kind of conflict with that uh quote is that uh actor james best um he's quoted as saying that he says quote i was the one responsible for that episode i told monty Pittman that i was born in kentucky but raised in, Indi in indiana one of the things i remember most about my childhood was the ghost stories i used to hear i collected ghost stories i told monty a couple stories and suggested he use one for a television series he told me if i write the script and direct it i'll have you in the cast i told him you do that i can't recall how much time had passed but one day i got word that i'm going to be on a twilight zone and i got to work with lee von cleef 
Struther Martin and Lee Marvin. And it turns out to be one of those ghost tales. Monty was such a pal and he remembered our agreement and kept his word. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then later, um, there's, there, like, this is, this story had some, um, I don't know, claims, not, not claims against it, but at least there was one written letter to Serling after it aired about it being potentially plagiarized. And there are some, I mean, there, there is, like, it, published stories to this effect but i think it's less that it was plagiarized and more that it is just a folklore it's it's urban legend and it, it i'm fine with that or whatever <laughs> but uh having run down the talent let's talk about this episode so before i get into the actual review i'll let you know what i knew before going in because this that's the whole concept of this podcast so <laughs> Uh, what I knew before going into the grave, that is a weird sentence, is I wasn't sure. Um, like, I knew that it was set in the Old West, and I kind of assumed maybe it's about a grave digger who is haunted by the ghosts of the people he buries or something. Um, I was pretty off on that, so I those are, were kind of my expectations going in. And so, having said that, let's go into my review of the grave. And right off the bat, it just, it really feels like... It's been a while in the chronology of the Twilight Zone since we've had like an Old West episode. And to be honest, I haven't really been that engaged with those episodes like Dust and Mr. Denton on Doomsday. Even the ones that dive into kind of time travel -y stories like A Hundred Yards Over the Rim and Execution, like those episodes that kind of meld a Western setting with modern day. Like, even even when it's in that context, those are hardly my favorite episodes of the series. Um, there's nothing really wrong with them. It, they just don't really gel well with me. And spoiler for the rest of this episode, but I kind of feel like The Grave falls under that same, um, that same problem, those same kind of pitfalls. I don't know if it's just uh, the setting or the, um, just my... I don't even I don't have strong opinions about the Western genre even so I don't know what it is exactly that causes me to kind of fall out of focus with uh, the Twilight Zone when it has a Western kind of setting but I don't know as we go on with the rest of the show um, maybe there will be an episode that will speak speak to me in a more profound way but as of yet I don't believe I've seen that so the episode opens with a, a town uh, kind of very uh, dusty, um, windy town, and you see a bunch of uh, people setting up um, to gun down a to gun down Pinto Sykes. And I found this to be a really interesting kind of action at the top of the episode, and it reminded me a bit of the beginning of A Nice Place to Visit way back in season one. Um, it's obviously a very different episode. That episode is about a criminal who's gunned down by by the police, and he is in the afterlife and it's you know spoiler for that episode but it is revealed at the end of the episode that he's actually in hell and it that that was a really cool episode but anyway so this is obviously a very different episode but i found it to be an interesting parallel to have these two episodes feature a man's death right in the opening scene and a man's death by gunfire and everything i just i found that to be really uh compelling to an extent Another note about this opening scene is that it reuses music from one of my favorite episodes, Shadowplay. Um, I just, I immediately clocked it as soon as it played. Like, it is it is the same musical notes of the music that's played at the beginning of Shadowplay. Um, God, I love Shadowplay so much. Uh, so, so having said, like, those, those elements kind of could have like could have engaged me better or could have made me more a little more primed to enjoy this episode but ultimately i just couldn't really get into it um so the the kind of mob uh calls out pinto sykes they shoot him he falls uh there's a there's a pretty interesting shot of his hand trying trying to sort of trying to grab the gun and i thought that was really interesting just in terms of kind of metaphor visual metaphor showing that him showing him trying to reach the gun uh, both to show that he's still alive and also to show that, you know, he's he's still, like, his instinct is to go for the gun. Um, so they pick him up, put him in jail. It's all done. And so I just want to say, like, the overall atmosphere here is really cool. Like, the wind billowing dust everywhere and kind of the desolation or, or um, just quietness of the, the lot that they filmed in and, and the town itself is really pretty engaging and pretty uh, pretty good atmosphere. 
So after they bring Pinto Sykes into the jail, um, Johnny Robb, uh, which is such a cool name, uh, and also for that matter, Pinto Sykes is a really cool name too, but um, anytime they refer to Johnny Robb, like it's just, I don't know if that's supposed to be like a first name and last name thing, and they just refer to him as that, but um, I don't know, it's just, it's such a, such a Western name, like Johnny Robb. Anyway, so he comes up and he talks to the old man and says, well, I guess that's all done. And the the old man, he um he reminds me, it's kind of reminiscent of the old man in Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? Because he's kind of a spectator in this scene. And he's kind of, I don't know, he's not as like wide-eyed and crazy, crazy-eyed as, I don't want to say crazy-eyed because that's a little dispar- disparaging of the actor in Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up. I don't mean any disrespect, but he's kind of like this kooky kind of old man character. Um, so it's vaguely reminiscent of that, which... Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up was at least written or directed or maybe both by Montgomery Pittman as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I think so. Um, anyway, so uh, to kind of close out this prologue, um, James Best's speaking voice is interesting. Like he it kind of is very different from his demeanor, like the way he looks like it defies his his the his kind of overall like look about him because he kind of looks like kind of like one of those kind of tough guy characters from the from the west western uh shows and stuff um in the western genre but he's got this kind of high-pitched and sheepish sheepish voice and that really plays into the way that his character is referred to as kind of a blabbermouth and he comes across throughout the episode as, as a bit cowardly. And it, that's the one thing that I could kind of latch onto in this episode is the way that he projects his cowardice onto Connie Miller, um, which we haven't been introduced to yet. So um, I'll talk about that uh, here in a bit. So uh, then after this, we get the opening narration by Rod Serling, which I will play right now. Normally, the old man would be correct. This would be the end of the story. We've had the traditional shootout on the street, and the bad man will soon be dead. But some men of legend and folktale have been known to continue having their way, even after death. The outlaw and killer Pinto Sykes was such a person. And shortly, we'll see how he introduces the town and a man named Connie Miller, in particular, to the Twilight Zone. Okay, so first of all, uh, Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up was directed by Montgomery Pittman and written by Rod Serling. So just to kind of clear that up uh, there. So um, so this opening narration, um, it's really striking to me seeing Serling in his suit and everything um, in an Old West set episode. It's kind of surreal and cool in a kind of um, uh, anachronistic kind of way. Um I just thought that that was really kind of kind of an interesting imagery to kind of have. Not that I would expect Serling to get dressed up as a cowboy or something <laughs> like that would be ridiculous, but seeing him in what I would um, what I would what I would kind of characterize as a modern day suit and tie kind of thing that is that is very much iconic to his um, to his his look and style and everything in an episode that's set so far in the past. I just found that to be really interesting and an interesting kind of visual cue to the kind of surreal, surreal, uh, surreal, surrealality um, <laughs> or surrealness of the Twilight Zone. So I just thought that was really interesting. And also, as I said before, the name Pinto Sykes is just a super cool name. <laughs> so I don't really have anything more to say about that. But um, yeah, so after we get back from the opening narration, um, Connie Miller arrives in the town and the old man comes in to fill comes into the scene to fill him at, fill him in about Pinto Sykes. And I've got to say, like the nighttime set of the town just looks really cool and ominous. Like it goes such a long way, like the lighting and the cinematography and everything, just that wide shot of the the town um, that isn't like it's it's dark and it's clearly like middle of the night um, time frame that goes such a long way to kind of create in the audience this visual cue that okay this is a this is a horror story this is a ghost story um and it is it is very much a kind of a conventional kind of urban legend ghost story in the twilight zone which i do appreciate the episode for that uh, quite a bit um even if i can't really even if i don't really 
like the episode that much. Um, I can still um, appreciate the way that it um, is really into that genre that it's depicting, both Western and kind of a ghost story um, thing, even in a kind of minimalistic way. Um, the set design and the lighting and everything goes a long way to kind of demonstrate that. And uh, yeah, so uh, Connie Miller goes into the bar and um, we learn from, I think it's um, not Johnny Rob, but uh, there's Johnny Rob, there's Steinhardt, and uh, I'm going to have to scroll up for this. <laughs> uh, we learn from uh, Mothershed that, oh, that's right, because that name is so cool too, Mothershed, I, like, and that's all he's referred to as is Mothershed. Um, I don't know, just kind of cool. So anyway, he informs Connie that they formed kind of a lynch mob of sorts. Um, out of eight shots fired, only one hit him, uh, hit Pinto Sykes, and no one is taking credit for it. No one knows who really shot him. And we learn that Connie has been on the hunt for Pinto for four months now, and that the town paid Connie to find Pinto. And that on his deathbed, Pinto claimed that Connie wasn't trying to catch him. And so Mothershed kind of delivers more expositions explaining that there's a new there's a new judge in town and that they told him they told the judge that they hired Connie to track Pinto because Pinto was using the town as quote his personal property which I found that pretty interesting um in terms of kind of giving background to this outlaw character kind of this idea that I mean he since he grew up in this town this is like his like kind of taking ownership of a town um is really interesting, a, a unique kind of window into the thought process of an outlaw. And so, so Mothershed explains that they told the judge that they didn't have any luck with, with Connie finding Pinto. So the judge told them to grow up and act like men. And that's what formed the idea to take the, take the law into their own hands and gun down Pinto in the street. So at this point, as it stands, this episode is kind of something of a cautionary tale about masculine pride and projection. So Johnny Robb is a big mouth who wouldn't dream of chasing bounties or visiting a potentially haunted grave at midnight, yet he antagonizes here in a bit. He antagonizes Connie, and he actually sets the wager as a means to prove that Connie is scared of Pinto Sykes after Pinto Sykes has died. And I just found that element really interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a bit, but I found it interesting that... Johnny Robb is, from my perspective, he is clearly projecting his insecurities and his fears onto Connie. Like in that, and that's somewhat a fault of the episode, also in the sense that it's kind of up in the air about Connie, Connie's kind of attitude, his his kind of viewpoint is a little bit too mysterious for my for my liking. Um, it's not fleshed out enough, like the. The guys in the bar are explaining that, oh, you know, we think you're scared of Pinto Sykes, and why else were you um, not catching him and everything? And we don't really get a sense of why he was doing that, or why he was letting Pinto Sykes go um, in, in no uncertain terms. So, and I'll talk about that here in a bit, but just, it, that's something that didn't really mesh well with me. So, anyway... To get back to the episode, Mothershed is talking about Pinto's final words, and he says that uh, Pinto told his his father that he was sorry for not being a better man, and he told Ion to marry a good man and get out of the town, and that he said that he wants to be married near his mom. And I found that interesting as a way to kind of humanize this outlaw character that we just saw get gunned down, um, and I thought that was kind of an interesting um, element to the story. So that's when Connie asks what Pinto said about him, said about him specifically, and uh, Mothershed says, well, he got real riled up when we mentioned you, and he explained that Pinto had said that the slower he ran away, the slower Connie chased him, and first of all, I just want to say shout out to my other podcast, Tower Junkies, but this element of it really reminded me of Stephen King's The Gunslinger, book one of the Dark Tower series, um, because that book, I mean, it starts with the iconic line, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed, and that's kind of the entire book of The Gunslinger is about the titular gunslinger, a the last of his kind, um, kind of a um, Arthurian knight with a gun type of thing, um, he is chasing the man in black across the desert. And, um, 
it's it's it, it just reminded me of that. And now, having talked about the Dark Tower for the last couple of minutes in this podcast, is now <laughs> more than we've talked about it on Tower Junkies for uh like years but anyway um so i just i always find that kind of funny we started tower junkies as a dark tower podcast and then we pivoted into a more just stephen king centric podcast and it's it always makes me laugh because we don't really talk that much about the dark tower because we're i mean there's tons of like i mean stephen king is such a prolific writer that i just find it funny that on a podcast called tower junkies we don't really talk about the dark tower that much anyway um so uh so anyway kind of to bring us into a more straightforward form of the kind of ghost story of this episode. Um, I believe it's Mothershed finishes by saying that Pinto said that if Connie ever gets close to his grave, he'll reach up and grab him. And so here's where I kind of fell a little bit out of favor with this episode. I do appreciate it. I do like that it is a kind of a conventional ghost story and it does have that feel of like urban legend kind of Uh, storytelling. And that's all stuff that I'm really into. I find that really engaging and really interesting in terms of like, like spooky storytelling. (laughs) But I just don't think there's enough substance to Connie as a character to really develop his fear of Pinto or the grave itself. So we're not really given a a clear explanation as to why Connie failed to catch Pinto. And I feel like the implication is that he was afraid to catch him, uh, maybe to avoid violence or maybe because of the risk of death. Um, he just kind of, he, he was, uh, he was not wanting to really catch up to him, but other factors like him being born in the same town and his pleasantries toward Ione when she comes into the bar, those kind of things make me wish that there was more development. And, I don't know, maybe something like he and Pinto were friends or he had other reasons not to be put into a position where he may have had to kill him. We don't get any of that. We don't get any indication of that or anything, but I feel like we need something like that to kind of explain to us um, why why Connie wasn't uh, too keen on catching Pinto. And I guess the kind of implication of the entire episode is that he was too afraid to, he was too fearful to, uh, to uh, catch up to him. And to that, like that, that's, that's fine. That's fine. That's a central theme of the episode. That's okay. However, I feel like there, we don't know enough about Connie outside of his role in terms of being hired to, to chase down Pinto. We don't know anything about him other than that thing. So I don't know. I kind of feel like there should be more to him to kind of give us this indication of why he is, why he was so hesitant to catch up to Pinto. And I also had a little bit of trouble kind of buying into Pinto's anger toward Connie. I felt like that was a little bit underdeveloped. However, I kind of, I kind of got, I, I, it took a bit of time, but I, I, I think I kind of rationalized it anyway. Pinto's anger toward Connie, I felt it was undeveloped because without us knowing why Connie was maybe purposely not trying to catch him, I feel like we don't really understand why Pinto wasn't trying to just get away. Because um, I think it's Mothershed says that, um, oh yeah, you know, he was talking about how um, he even, like, you know, he even he even kind of slowed down uh, so that you could catch up to him and stuff. And I'm just like, what? like, I don't quite understand why he would do that. And why he wouldn't get away. I don't think there's enough there to really sell us on why he was, you know, not just trying to get away from him uh, entirely. And like, and that made me kind of wonder, like, does it all come down to like the town uh, being Pinto's personal property and and, uh, Connie being from the town? Like, is there a history there that causes like caused him not to uh, not to flee Connie or anything? I don't know. Or. Did Pinto want to be captured and Connie's head hesitance? This is where I kind of feel like this is where I kind of rationalized it. But I wondered if Pinto uh, wanted to be captured and Connie's hesitance led Pinto back to the town where he was ultimately gunned down. So my thought is that um, Pinto, as as he's described um, when when Connie asks what 
what he said about him, he's told that uh, Pinto got all riled up at the mention of Connie. And I kind of wonder if that's because he knew that he was dying and that he wouldn't have been gunned down if Connie had just captured him. So I kind of get that. I, if that's the intention, I, I can get behind that. And I can really kind of respect that in terms of storytelling because he, Pinto, I could see Pinto's um, kind of viewpoint of what happened being that, okay, because of Connie, I am now going to die. Like, uh, Connie is responsible for my death, and that is why he is he got, quote-unquote, all riled up and everything. And that's kind of in keeping with that, that kind of outlaw um, kind of persona. Like, uh, I'm not responsible for my own actions, even though I'm in violation of the law and everything. So I can kind of respect that, but that is... Like, those thoughts, the, that thought process that I had for that is contingent on me doing a lot of legwork that I don't feel like is necessarily in the script, or it's not, it's not really that deep in the script, or it's not, it's not clearly spoken. Like, this is all stuff that I um, kind of had to infer from, from the episode. So Connie claims that Pinto was lying, and he says that he searched for him all over Albuquerque, um, but he just he didn't stay there long enough to stay there. And this is another kind of issue, because um, I guess we're meant to infer that Connie is, is lying to save face, that he was actually kind of uh, letting Pinto flee because he didn't want to have that confrontation. Again, we don't really know why. It's not spelled out to us why that would be the case. It's left for us to kind of infer, but... Also, I kind of, um, I don't know, I just, I kind of wish that there was a little bit more to that. Um, I just wish there was a little more to that. So anyway, um, Ione arrives at the bar, and she startles everyone. And again, this is playing into that kind of ghost story um, story, <laughs> and um, I respect it for that in terms of the tone and, and the energy of it, because this is a... This is a this is a mostly maybe not mostly empty bar, but this is a this is a bar that doesn't have a lot of people. It's the middle of the night. It's windy. It's very like the tone is very much you know um, scary. So she goes up to the bar and she orders a bottle of whiskey. Says that it's for herself. It's clear that she's grieving the loss of her brother. And so she. By the way, my cat is going crazy. I hope you guys aren't hearing all of this, but she's got the zoomies. So hopefully she is. Hopefully she settles down. Anyway. So she tells Connie, uh, Connie kind of greets her with pleasantries, and she tells Connie, uh, this I thought was really interesting, she says, uh, I was just talking to my brother about you just the day before last, and it's interesting because she was, uh, like, that's her, his deathbed. <laughs> it's just interesting, that contrast of saying that, oh, I was talking to my brother about you in this casual manner, but, like, leaving out the fact that, oh, you know, it was on his deathbed after he was gunned down because you didn't catch him, um you didn't catch him. It was left up to the town to murder him in the street. Um, and again, that kind of just like the tone of that really reminded me of the gunslinger by Stephen King. So I should, I should have really liked this episode, but unfortunately I, I really didn't. So, um, she kind of reiterates that, uh, all Connie has to do to find, to actually catch up to Pinto now is to go up, walk up to the grave to see him again. And it just has this really kind of cool tone to it, this very threatening but inviting tone. Um, this kind of it's it's with the, it's a threat, but it is kind of just in that pleasantry kind of tone. So I, I just thought that that was really interesting. And so it's her kind of taunting Connie, trying to frighten him, and then as she leaves. Um, there's this laugh that she gives that is just haunting and it was really cool because it like this it's very short it's very brief and it's played again she she laughs that way again at the end of the episode but the way it's kind of accentuated by the howling wind is just so cool it reminded me of um, some of the kind of well on that five dollar patreon level I have a commentary track for throne of blood and I've referenced Throne of Blood a lot um, these past couple of weeks on the podcast. But anyway, um, it reminds me of that kind of, um, like, I, kind of um, Japanese filmmaking kind of thing. Um, I don't know if this is tailored to that specifically, but I know it from, like, Kurosawa movies that this this heightened laughter, this, this laughter that's, like, projecting on the soundtrack um, to kind of get this the, to kind of complement the tone rather than give this example of a uh, character kind of being in a humor <laughs> humorous way um i just found that interesting the way that it kind of complemented the tone of the episode as a ghost story so 
Um, after she leaves, they, the, the people in the bar, they start asking Connie if he's afraid of Pinto's grave and they get into a scuffle. And, uh, I think it's more, mostly Johnny Robb who's kind of goading him, um, indirectly. And so Connie lashes out at him, says, nobody calls me a coward. Very Marty McFly vibes there. <laughs> so, um, Johnny Robb, after being slapped and threatened with, with, um, with violence, which I thought that was interesting that to kind of complement his whole, um, that idea of him being kind of, uh, being kind of fearful and, and a coward himself and projecting that cowardice onto Connie. Um, Johnny, Johnny Rob, uh, immediately when he is face to face with Connie after goading him, like his immediate thing is like, I'm not armed. I'm not armed. I'm not armed. <laughs> um, I thought that was interesting, but anyway, so Johnny Rob, bets Connie a $20, $20 gold piece that he won't go up to the grave um, at the in the middle of the night and visit the grave uh, to prove that he's not afraid of it. And uh, Steinhardt, who is in, is in the bar as well, he wants a piece of that action, puts down another 20 piece. And at this point, <laughs> on my first viewing, I have in my notes, this episode is kind of boring. <laughs> I'm dozing off. And I, I did grow to appreciate it a little bit more um, as as I rewatched it and everything. And I think that that's just kind of the fact that I was rewatching it multiple, multiple times that I kind of found something to latch on to. But in that first viewing, I was just really not engaged with it. So uh, Connie takes up the bet and he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll be back soon and everything. And then, uh, by the way, that was, I guess my, um, my, uh, Lee Marvin impression. I'll be back soon. Um, anyway, so Steinhardt says like, okay, Connie, hang on what you're going to do. We need to figure out some details, uh, just so we know that you didn't go and, um, just go there and leave. You need to stick this Bowie knife in the ground to signal that you visited the grave. So Connie leaves to go to the grave and, Kind of as as part of an act break here, I do want to say that the wager itself is maybe the episode's biggest shortcoming for me, and and what is the reason why I'm just not that interested in this episode as a whole. So I would have much preferred that Connie Miller be more developed as a character, um, and I really would have preferred if his motivation for going to the grave wasn't this wager amongst the, his friends in the town, but more this symbolic gesture. Because it's established that he spent four months chasing Pinto, and I feel like Connie going to the grave could have been a way for him to confront his own shortcomings, whether it's him allowing Pinto to elude him um, because he was afraid to capture him, or if he genuinely just couldn't find him and it's him trying to, you know, uh, finally complete his the thing he was hired to do in getting Pinto. Um, but the wager kind of overshadows any chance of that type of story and that type of characterization in Connie. And it makes it about Connie, Connie's image and his pride amongst the townspeople that he grew up with, presumably. Which, that's compelling enough. I can appreciate that, I guess. But ultimately, it just doesn't work for me. And again, at this point, I'm just very bored with this episode on my first viewing. And I think part of that might be because I was really sleepy because it was like the middle of the night um, and I didn't have a grave to go visit to wake me up or kill me. But uh, it was it was still just kind of not really that interesting to me. So uh, when we get back from the act break, um, Connie arrives at the graveyard and that set just looks really cool very gothic-y very dark and windy and everything the wind that perve permeates throughout this whole episode is is really cool um it's it's very much um uh, evocative of the tone that the episode is going for and at the grave gravesite we see Ione again and she's kind of cloaked and that's again just really good imagery this very uh dark mournful um spirit or specter among the grave and, and embodied by uh, Ione. And she offers Connie the whiskey. And this is something I didn't catch until like my fourth or fifth time watching this episode, but we see that she's already drank most of the bottle. And I found that to be really interesting as just kind of a, a visual cue that she's obviously grieving her dead brother. And her speech as she's talking is very distant and creepy. And there's like a little bit of an affectation to it because it's complemented by the wind. Um, really cool. And she does again, that really slight laugh as she leaves. Um, and I just found that really disturbing and, and ghostly. Um, but she mentions that, uh, like Connie, again, it's, it's interesting because when she offers him the whiskey, 
Connie says, I don't need, I don't need, um, I don't need alcohol to, uh, stiffen my nerves or whatever, which I thought was funny because I think in the trivia, I found that Lee Marvin was kind of a drunk and would uh, show up on set drunk and everything. And that's something that I found really interesting is that like one of the co-stars said that like, oh yeah, he would show up drunk on set, he, but he, it didn't affect his job. He was, you know, he was really professional and remembered his lines. And like, like hearing that in 2021, I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's a different era. Cause I mean, I don't know. I like, it just seems like uh, too much romanticizing the idea of like this, this kind of drunk guy who's kind of unprofessional and everything like, you know, fuck him. He's, he's like, he's creating a the hostile work environment, uh, by, uh, you know, showing up drunk is, I don't know, different era. But anyway, Connie walks up to the grave and he hears rustling and there's a door clanging nearby and everything. It's very atmospheric, very scary. And he is startled by it. And he goes back, he, he has his gun out and everything. But when he, when he, when he notices like the door is done or whatever, like he, he recognizes what that is. He slowly starts to go back to the grave and the way that he sticks the knife into the soil is almost violently. And again, I feel like that would have benefited from having more history with him and having more um, context as to why it's important for him to, you know, leave the knife there in terms of the wager and if there's any deeper meaning with him and Pinto, because we don't know anything about their relationship or anything about his history with, with the outlaw he was chasing, if there was one. Um, I just feel like it's kind of a failing of the of the characterization that I'm kind of left to assume that there could be something there. Like, it's just not a well-developed character trait in this. So after he uh, sticks the knife in the ground, um, we get a very quick shot of him being grabbed. Um, it's off screen. It's, it's performed really well. Like he has this, um, it's almost not, not like a pratfall, but it is this very quickly edited, quickly shot, um, image of him falling to the ground. And we don't see anything coming up and reaching him and, and grabbing him or anything. It's left to our imagination. And it's just quick enough to where it's something that is, it's cut away to almost immediately. So it it's like, wait, did I could see people thinking like, was there a hand there? Like, is there like, is there something that we could have seen? Um, but there, it didn't last a long, last long enough on screen to, for us to kind of register it. So I found that to be really interesting as a kind of a jump scare moment in this episode. So the next day arrives and we learn that Connie never came back after going to the grave site and Johnny Rob feels guilty. And I found that interesting as a piece of characterization for Johnny Rob because this is the loudmouth reaping what he's sown and he's nervous he's scared he's worried that he got Connie killed and so Ione comes back with a plate and she explains that this plate was Pinto's it was like his favorite plate in the world so I'm gonna take it up to his grave and everything and the guys say oh well we'll come with you because Connie never returned and we'll come with you to take the plate to the grave and everything and it kind of has like a small very small hint of like oh we're 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 men we're going to protect protect a woman as she goes to this place that could be haunted <laughs> by her brother um it kind of seems like a little bit of posturing there maybe i'm maybe i'm projecting onto the episode but i don't know um that's something that could have been uh inferred by it in my opinion so they get to the grave they see that connie is dead and steinhardt goes into kind of this sherlock holmes style breakdown of what happened because and i do want to mention that james best his performance as he says uh when they see when they see connie's body he's like oh i knowed it i knowed it i got a man killed um that's my best james best impression <laughs> so um i don't know i just i I thought that was funny and, and kind of, I don't know, it was, it was silly in a way. Um, but it is very much in keeping with the Johnny Robb character as this kind of cowardly guy who is projecting his cowardice onto a, a bounty hunter lawman, um, who, I don't know, he it lives a life that Johnny Robb couldn't possibly, um, understand or, or participate in himself. So, Steinhardt goes into this whole Sherlock Holmes style breakdown of it. Um, and he is applying logic to Connie's death saying that, Oh, what must have happened is that he must have put the, put the knife down and then accidentally, um, pinned his coat to it. And then when he stood up and felt the tug, 
Um, he must have thought that it was um, uh, the Pinto Sykes coming up from the grave to grab him, and then that's what killed him. And I thought that was really interesting. And it's a, it's a nice moment where Ione dispels that theory entirely. <laughs> she points out that the wind uh, blowing her cloak away from the was blowing her cloak away from the grave, and they established that it was the wind was blowing in the same direction that it was blowing the night before. And I found that really interesting that Ione has this slight smile on her face. Like she's so satisfied that her brother got his revenge and got his, got his, um, got his revenge on Connie. It's just this very sinister, just slight smile on her face, which I thought was really interesting. And then, I mean, that's the episode and it's, uh, it, it's, it, that's it. Like we get the closing narration from Serling, which I'll play right now. So here's the closing narration from Rod Serling. <laughs> <laughs> Final comment. You take this with a grain of salt or a shovel full of earth as shadow or substance. We leave it up to you. And for any further research, check under G for ghosts in the Twilight Zone. And again, as a ghost story, this is fairly effective, I guess. Um, but overall, it just didn't work for me. And I, I'm so glad that I included the clip of her laughing in that, because that, that laughter is just so eerie and unsettling to me. Um, and I don't know. So this episode overall, just yeah, like I said, it just didn't work for me. Um, it is this kind of ghost story horror element to the show um, that I, I would normally be super into and everything. It just, something about it just didn't work for me. I think it's just the, um, like a lack of characterization for, um, Connie Miller as, as a character and like the social commentaries or the, or the themes and ideas that are present in the episode are things that I kind of had to work for to find. And I just, I wasn't really that crazy about it. Um, before I get to the actual trivia of the episode, though, I do have a couple of things. So first of all, um, actually, I think this is part of the trivia, but I have it in the wrong place on my notes. So anyway, this was the third of three episodes to actually use the name Sykes for a character. Um, the name Sykes was featured in A Penny for Your Thoughts and Dust. So we are now retiring the character name of Sykes in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> and uh, there were a couple of alternate closing narrations for the episode, which were not used. Um, they, according to the uh, unlocking the door to a television classic, the, uh, they were designed to start over Ion's walk and, um, yeah, I, I'm going to try, I'm going to read the, the text of it. It's going to be a terrible shit show of a Serling impression, but I'm going to read the two alternate closing narrations. So, um, the first one is legend folk. Now that's a terrible impression. Jesus. Um, legend folk tale or just an apocryphal old wives tale passed down from one naive young generation to the next. That's all possible. But death just as life itself has little pockets of mystery, little caves of unexplored depths and uninhabited basements too dark to distinguish what is shadow and what is sub substance. This one we leave up to you. Does a marker on a mound of earth may, uh, mean the end? Maybe the answer is in one of the caves, holes, or basements of the world. Or maybe it's one that can only be found in the Twilight Zone. Um, I actually really, really like that. And also to comment on the one that was used in the final product and this alternate one, I really like the use of shadow and substance in, in it. I just think that that's really cool. And then there was another alternate closing narr uh, narration that was, wasn't was used. This one was dated March 23rd, 1961, but, and it's also brief, as is the one that aired, of course, but it's, uh, quote, legend, folktale, shadow, or substance. We leave it up to you. Take it with tongue-in-cheek or question mark in mind. But if you plan to put it to a test, find a friendly grave and mark uh, and make your overtures in daylight. That's tonight's suggestion from the Twilight Zone. Um, I like that one too. I think I, I think I prefer the two alternate closing narrations to what aired. And I would assume that, um, <laughs> that second one would have maybe caused some problems. Um, <laughs> cause it's, uh, like, oh, hey, find, go out and find a friendly grave and mark your overture, <laughs> like mark it and everything. Um, that, I don't know, that could have caused some problems in the legal department, <laughs> I guess. So trivia for this episode is that, as I alluded to in the uh, talent rundown of this episode of the podcast, is that Lee Marvin, Strether Martin, and Lee Von Cleef all appeared in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, which was released only six months after this episode aired. So that was interesting. And so to kind of go into the... Um, 
the urban legend of this story. So I have a quote from, I think this is from the IMDb page, and I'll just read it. Quote, many reviewers have cited Leo Rostin's very short story, The Path Through the Cemetery, as the source of this episode. Actually, I think this is from Wikipedia. Anyway, <laughs> while this much anth anthologized tale is probably the immediate source, there are many other available ones, which include the three essential story elements, a grave, a wager, and a knife. The oldest printed version in, in English to be found dates back to 1825, when it appeared in the pages of the Terrific Register. The story has been recently um, reprinted in the compilation Tales from the Terrific Register uh, in a Book of Ghosts in 2010. And the setting is Westminster Abbey around the year 1734 when the Henry VII Chapel Vault has been opened for the admission of the Queen's body. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to read the rest of that, but... Uh, Kind of interesting. It's it's folklore, uh, essentially. Folklore in the Twilight Zone. And so this episode is also referenced in Richard Linklater's 2016 movie, Everybody Wants Some, which is a movie I haven't seen, despite being a huge fan of um, uh, Dazed and Confused. Um, but also it's worth noting that the, I think the, the reference in everybody wants some to this episode is that a character has it on VHS or something, has like a copy of this episode on VHS. But I believe that character's name is Willoughby, which I believe is also a reference to uh, the Twilight Zone. And, um, yeah, okay, that's all the trivia I have. So, <laughs> overall thoughts on The Grave, it's fine. I mean, it. I think it's something that I... Um, I don't, I think I've gotten the most out of it that I can. <laughs> and, um, I think it's, uh, overall, it's, it's, it's not really for me, um, but I can see it being, um, an interesting kind of Halloween time period episode. Um, and it did, I mean, it aired on, on October 27th. So, I mean, it, maybe it did suit the season and everything. I just think in terms of substance, I don't think there was enough there for me to really latch on to it. So those are my thoughts on uh, The Grave. And yeah, so I'm going to round out this episode with a brief spoiler-free review for the Science Fiction Theater Season 1, Episode 16 episode titled The Stones Began to Move. So here we go with that... Um, with that with that review and here's the stinger i had to remember which sound pad it was So The Stones Began to Move originally aired on August 9th, 1955, and uh, yeah, the plot summary is a discovery inside the recently opened tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh may hold a clue as to the construction of the pyramids. This episode was directed by Lou Landers, written by Doris Gilbert, and stars Basil Rathbone, Robin Short, Gene Willis... Uh, Jonathan Hale and Richard Flatto. Uh, Gene Willis, or Wiles, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, actually appeared in the episode Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, which, as I referenced early in this episode, was directed by uh, Montgomery Pittman, who wrote and directed The Grave. So, as is customary with science fiction theater, it begins with a pre-show kind of demonstration by the host Truman Bradley. And this one I found really kind of funny, um, unintentionally funny, I think. So he appears on screen and the first thing he says is, I'm your host Truman Bradley, here's a coil of rope and here's a pyramid. And it just, it felt really funny to me as it was kind of a completely unintentionally funny, just complete non sequitur. Um, and it felt just so casual, like, I'm your host Truman Bradley, here's a coil of rope and here's a pyramid. Um, I thought it was kind of funny. So, um, it was a pretty intriguing, um, kind of introduction to the episode, um, because he kind of demonstrates or talks about this Indian rope trick and how it like creates this illusion that a rope can be elevated by like defying gravity and stuff. And he talks about that in relation to the mystery surrounding the construction of the pyramids in ancient Egypt. And it's all pretty intriguing. It brought me into the episode, made me kind of um, interested to see what the episode was going to have to offer and everything. 
And so to actually get into the actual episode, it introduces us to the character Paul Kincaid. Uh, he, the opening scene, and this is so interesting because um, <laughs> it's similar to the opening scene of um, The Grave. Uh, it's just weird that uh, this kind of coincidence comes up because it's completely random that I paired this episode with, with The Grave. But Paul Kincaid is a scientist, I think, or he's a doctor, um, and he's trying to reach reach out to a doctor about something. It's very frantic. He says he's being followed and that his life is in danger. Uh, we are told that he returned from Egypt where he opened the tomb of a pharaoh. And so he, because uh, he, he like tries to use a payphone and it doesn't work. And so he runs into a, like an arcade or something. And he goes into this recording booth to record his message, um, which again, it also kind of reminds me of The Simpsons. Um <laughs> <laughs> the CIA had like contracted Homer to uh to surveil Mr. Burns because he had stole like a trillion dollar bill and uh he goes into a photo booth um and like his handler takes him into a photo booth and he's like this is where we have dead drops for our um uh, our agents and everything and you just have to know the secret code word and it's cheese <laughs> and then Apu goes in and he says cheese anyway so um, he's recording it in the booth in what looks like an arcade, but he can't finish his message because dun dun dun, he's shot and killed. And I felt like that was a decent hook for the episode. And I've always been mildly curious about the pyramids in ancient Egypt and everything, and mildly interested in it, specifically because I read in like when I was when I was in like third or fourth grade, I read the book, the Goosebumps book, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb which I loved it. I loved it as a kid. I really loved that entry in the Goosebumps series. So I'm, I've been kind of interested in this as a subject, sort of. Um, so I thought that this setting or this, this it dealing with that would be pretty interesting for this episode. Unfortunately, the episode itself is kind of lackluster. Um, there, the mystery as it develops that surrounds both uh, Paul Kincaid, who obviously dies early in the episode, and his wife, Mrs. Kincaid, um, the mystery surrounding their work and why it's why it kind of brings about this uh, kind of uh, <laughs> this group that's trying to kill them, um, it's it just wasn't interesting to me, <laughs> and I I found myself really wishing that they would go deeper into the mystery of the pyramids themselves. And there's some of that. It's basically boils down to there was a discovery that some people are wanting to get for some reason. And um, they're trying to get it in the right hands. And, and people are trying to get it for, for nefarious purposes. Um, and that's all well and good. But I kind of wish that they would have gone deeper into, like I said, the mystery of the pyramids. Because I found that to be more compelling and everything and not to i'm not going to spoil it or anything but the resolution of the central mystery and the reveal of like who's behind it and and what they're why they're behind it and everything was really really bland to me <laughs> like really just like laughably bad like there's a scene where mrs kincaid and um like the scientist who's assisting her or or helping her um i think it's the doctor that Paul Kincaid was trying to reach out to about his discovery before he was killed. Anyway, there's a scene where the two of them are held at gunpoint and it is like the most stiff, like not, um, compelling or, or I don't know. It, it's, it's very stiff and awkward, but like slight spoiler, um, the guy, uh, I don't remember exactly how it happens, but like he, he wrestles the guy for the gun and it's so like poorly choreographed and awkward. Like it's no, there's no tension to it. Like it's just, he basically grabs a gun. It is almost like he, it, this isn't what happens, but it gives the impression of the, of the type of like hokey kind of choreographed, like uh tense moment where it felt like he just tapped the guy on the shoulder and he looked the other way and he grabbed it out of his hand and had that type of energy. So I didn't really like that. Um, and yeah, and it's just, uh, it was, it was fine. I, I really hope that I get more interested in science fiction theater as I progress through the series, because I would hate to really lose steam on, on that for these reviews. 
But um, yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes if I can find this episode online. I've been having some good fortune of finding these episodes online. Um, so check it out for yourself. Maybe uh, it's something, maybe it's better than I'm giving it credit for. But overall, I just kind of felt a little bit like uh, just kind of bland and everything. So so yeah, and uh, it, that kind of sucks because I, I wasn't really that crazy about The Grave. So this this episode, the two the two shows that I'm reviewing in this episode of the podcast kind of is a little bit of a wash, um, <laughs> kind of a bummer. But having said that, next week, I'm very excited because I'm going to be reviewing uh, episode eight of the Twilight Zone's third season, It's a Good Life. And this is a big episode uh, in terms of pop culture relevance and like it is something that is a mainstay of like it's it feels to me as someone who hasn't seen it yet it feels to me like a big episode in the canon of the twilight zone and i'm just really excited to get to this kind of pivotal episode i'm excited to return to the the uh acting work of bill moomy I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and I'm hoping I'm getting that right because I don't have that in front of me. But anyway, I'm also excited because my bonus review for that episode will be from the 2002 Twilight Zone episode. It's still a good life, and I'm very excited about that because A, the 2002 episode is available on YouTube. I'll put a link in the show notes and everything if you haven't seen it. But also, because to my knowledge, this is the only episode of the Twilight Zone to have a direct sequel. And I'm just really excited to see how, like, how that comes into play and, uh, and what's, what's done there. Uh, like, how, how the story is continued from the original series to the 2002 series. Like, the 2002 series isn't, like, isn't, isn't really that great. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it, what I've seen of it, it hasn't been, like, that strong, obviously. But I'm still really excited because it's continuing a story from the original series. So I'm curious how that plans out, or how that pans out uh, for the greater Twilight Zone canon. Um, again, that does mean, unfortunately, guys, I'm going to have to take a break from science fiction theater. So hopefully you guys can hold off for my expert analysis of science fiction theater. They show that it is largely um, lost to time since the <laughs> DVD set is out of print. But um, I hope you guys don't mind me taking a break from science fiction theater for one week. And then I'll be back the week after for... Um, to resume my science fiction theater analysis. So hopefully you guys can can weather the storm and hear me talk about two episodes of The Twilight Zone next week. So uh, I don't know if this bit is carrying over or this is working. I don't know. But anyway, um, that's it for this episode of Anthology. Thank you guys so much for listening. And once again, check out Patreon, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. I am making such a strong effort to put a ton of content on Patreon uh, throughout 2021. And I'm very pleased with the amount of output I'm, I'm having on Patreon. So, um, once again, $1 gets you B-roll episodes that are just kind of casual conversations released pretty much any time one of my other podcasts release an episode. And uh, $2 gets you access to my reviews of TV shows that I'm doing and everything. $5 gets you movie commentary tracks and videos of me after I see movies in theaters again. Oh my God, I can't wait. So... That's all that. And then $10 gets you all of that, plus early access to episodes and unreleased content. So hopefully you guys check that out. And uh, yeah, go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Also check out my other shows, Obsessive Viewer and Tower Junkies. And uh, having said all that, thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. And here's my review of episode 4 of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Hopefully it's better than episode 3 because I didn't like that episode so i hope there's a bounce back so here's my review of episode four hi patreon apparently that's a thing that i do now (laughs)
So, um, I am here tonight to uh, regale you with my thoughts and feelings about episode four of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, titled The Whole World is Watching. It aired tonight, or today, on uh, April 9th on Disney+, Plus, and I watched it after work today. Anthology is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to anthologypod.com slash archive. You can also like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, and follow the show on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at anthologypod.com slash donate or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. Official Anthology merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more can be found in the Obsessive Viewer's Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at anthologypod.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at teepublic.com. For information about the Obsessive Viewer's annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find our flagship movie and TV review and discussion show, The Obsessive Viewer Podcast, at obsessiveviewer.com, and on Twitter at Obsessive Viewer. You can also find Tower Junkies, a podcast where Matt and co-host Tiny share their love of all things Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series, over at TowerJunkiesPod.com and at TowerJunkiesPod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast, which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at TheSecularPerspective.com. Bumper music for this podcast comes courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at Facebook.com slash As Good As It Gets Band. You can also find As Good As It Gets music on Spotify, Google Play, and iTunes. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Kitty! I know that! I know that I got a man killed!